Good morning, Jeep fans. It's Green Dot 319. Welcome to the great outdoors where the only person stupid enough to be outside is myself and animals who don't get a choice in the matter. As you can see, it's cold enough that we've had to put a little bit of cardboard in the front grille there to keep the heat in the engine because otherwise it's just not getting up to temperature today on these little drives around. So just making a little bit of a uh, change there to improve the Jeep. And that brings us on to what we're going to be looking at today, which is the top five worst features of the World War II Jeep. Now, of course, I know you'll say, Matt, there are no problems with this Jeep. There are no worst features. Every feature on this Jeep is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. This is God's greatest vehicle and I would agree with you but there are a couple of things we can look at which on the face of it may look like bad features but actually if we delve a little bit deeper into it will turn out to actually be part of the design of the Jeep and why they exist is due to the way that this thing was made and the job it had to do. So let's have a delve in there and see what some of the top five worst features are then. Okay, gents, number one uh, bad feature, or should I say, this is just a gripe. This is what we're going with. We're going with gripes, okay? They're not really bad features of it because they all have a reason for existing. Is the thing is too damn small, okay? The average height in World War II of a soldier was apparently five foot eight, American soldier that is. Um, I'm 6'2", um, and I'm not especially um, fat or anything like that, so, you know, I'm, I'm relatively slim. I'm probably not as slim as a soldier in World War II, but getting in and out of this thing is, is difficult. It's a squeeze, and especially from the angle you're just about to see. It looks like I'm entering some sort of toy vehicle or something like that, so let's get in then. So you've got to shimmy yourself in. So you've got to get your foot up to start off with, and especially when you're wearing the, the, the big clothes to keep warm, it, it makes it more difficult, okay? So I've hit this steering column already, Shifting myself there. My stomach is now touching the steering wheel underneath there. And like we said, I'm not particularly uh, portly or anything like that, sort of. Um, there we go, shifty in, leg up. All right, <laughs> we're in the beast. Okay, and we can see already, my knees are all the way up here above the dash here, right? My knee here is touching the uh, gear stick. And from this angle here, if I sit here, I can't actually see the uh, instrument cluster here. This is in the way, but my knee is just about in the way. And the view I've got here, I've got this dash light in the way, so I can't see the ammeter. So you can see, you feel like a bit of a giant sitting inside this thing, okay? And then if you try to use the pedals as well, the pedals are adjustable. You can move them up and back. There's uh, two notches, so you can move it forward and backwards, which is a great feature. So they did think about this sort of thing. So that it's not just, uh, you know, they haven't just not thought about this stuff. The steering column can also be moved up and down just a little bit. It's not actually touching me but it's just about touching me but if you've got the big boots on your feet there's very little room to move your feet around here if you see if I go onto the brake there hopefully you can see this you know if I'm on the accelerator go onto the brake they're sort of touching already so the size is a bit of a problem then so why is a damn thing so small? Well, of course, that is one of its greatest strengths. It was designed to be this small. It's just a small reconnaissance vehicle. And the one thing you don't want with a small reconnaissance vehicle is a massive silhouette. If we come down to this level here, you can just see how flat the World War II Jeep is. Nothing sticks out over the top. It's all in line. You could hold a ruler right along the top of the bonnet there, go across. And if you took the radio and the steering column out, pretty much, you know, it'd be flat right across the top. So this thing is a little vehicle specifically because it has to be a little vehicle keep that silhouette small keep it low you can hide it behind bushes and things and you can keep it out of harm's way nothing sticking out of the top nothing to get shot at keeps you safe and keeps you secret as well so its size is its strength and just because it's difficult for you to get in and out of doesn't mean that it's a bad design I'm thinking this is going to be <laughs> it doesn't look far but I've got to get back over right should we leap to where the cows have been drinking out of the water here hold on oh <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Oh man, this was soft. No. Oh, okay, right. We've <laughs> uh, we've made it across, guys. Well, um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, we made it across there. Uh, getting back across is going to be slightly difficult. I think the cows really did one um, there. Right, hold on. Okay, so, so far we've made it across. This is good, but this is a perfect example we're just about to see of the importance of this little vehicle and why it's so low. So let's come across then. There is a World War II fighting vehicle hiding behind this hedge in winter, just around here. Look at that, that's incredible, okay? That's a bare hedge in winter, and you can just, you can just about see it. You can't see it over the top, but there it is. How important is that size to this vehicle? Absolutely fantastic. Anything higher, any top on it, any winter hood or anything like that, it'd be visible, but it's just hidden away there. Really fantastic example there. Worth getting uh, muddy. I've got to get across now. It's steeper on this side. The cows have gone down here, but I've got to get back over. Um, wish me luck. 
Yeah, I'm going to take the car's way out. Number two on the green dot gripes. The damn thing isn't waterproof, okay. Now, again, this isn't really an actual problem because what vehicles of this sort of vintage and of this sort of uh, doing this sort of job, you know, not a proper amphibious vehicle, were waterproof in World War II. It's probably as waterproof as it needs to be. Let's have a look then. So, inside the engine here, we've got all our, our bits and bobs, pretty much everything. Um, doesn't have any level of waterproofing to it okay water can get in everywhere the generator is completely open if you go into the water here it'll come flooding in there your starter is all the way down here when i took one of these starters apart i found a tide mark of mud and crud in the bottom of it where water had been collected from fording and things like that the voltage regulator has a seal but i think water could still get inside it the distributor's open there there's a hole in the cap they made a dust proof version later but not a waterproof version whole ignition system water leaks down off here when it's raining and falls on top of the spark plugs here you've got these caps here they're not rain caps there to stop um, you shorting the uh, spark plugs out and things falling on it but you know you can start to get problems um, i forded this and uh, when the water all sprays up you do start getting ignition uh, problems and it starts to die a bit so you have to put the power on quickly and run out of there but they did think of this they do have the arm here, you can undo it, you can remove the um, fan belt and you can stop the fan spinning when you're going to forward it. Now, one of the things about this is they understood this limitation of the vehicle and that's why they had preventative maintenance and also post maintenance as well. So when you expected to take this thing forwarding uh, or after you'd been forwarding with it, there are prescribed things you're supposed to do to sort it out to make sure that it keeps on running. Now, obviously, when you were taking it... Um, properly underwater like they did on D-Day where they drove it out of the uh, landing ships and things like that. You had to cover the whole thing in asbestos. There's this asbestos putty and you cover it all up. It must have taken absolutely hours to do. Cover it all up, um, put it everywhere. I reckon water would have still gotten it all over the place and then it would have taken an equal amount of time um, to get all that asbestos putty off there. But there were things you were supposed to do when you were supposed to properly take it underwater. Just as a side note, I found out on the carburetor, there's a little hole um, for the um, accelerator pump and they were having problems with some of these carburetors after D-Day. They weren't sure what it was and what they found is when they put the asbestos on it, the putty around it, the little hole was getting clogged up with the asbestos putty and you're getting poor performance out of the WO carburetor. Anybody know that? Well, there you go, there's a free tip. But anyway, you could forward this thing, there was a lot of maintenance to do, but the other thing was, just for normal use, there was also maintenance as well. We've got our um, differentials here, and we've got these little breather caps on it. You can see the breather cap there, the SW Stuart Warner on it. Um, water gets in there and fills these differentials up. So once you'd taken this thing, through the mud and through the water and all the water had got inside your differential and your transfer case and things like that you're supposed to drain it and sort it out and put new oil in there okay but obviously in a war field or in uh, wartime operations that's not particularly easy to do is it so a lot of these jeeps did get wet you obviously will get a lot more wear when you've got watery oil running around in the differentials and things like that so that didn't really matter did it because these jeeps had a very short lifetime and once they got knackered they got uh, rebuilt down the echelons and things like that so the fact that it's not waterproof isn't really too much of a problem they had ways to deal with it you know they didn't have a great life um, anyway and you were supposed to prepare your jeep for when you were taking it in the water anyway so really i don't think it's much of a problem but it is still a problem so the thing isn't waterproof number two the number three green dot gripe is the damn thing isn't weatherproof either now this is more of a problem okay and this is again this is due to the limitation of what this vehicle actually is being a small reconnaissance vehicle okay you can't have a big winter top on it you know you wouldn't want to be driving around um, you know let's say Normandy or what have you with a big winter top up here we've seen we've already gone behind that bush you can see how low the profile is so the winter top had to be easy to put up collapsible and easy to put away okay and what you have is I don't have fitted to mine yet just at the moment there would you believe they're coming this week is you have these big bows which go through here go around the back they go to either side and then the top comes up and it hangs off your windshield and I haven't got my windshield attached yet still haven't got hold of one of those and that keeps a little bit of weather off the top of you but the problem with that wind uh, windproof top or should I say that uh, top is that the water comes all the way down the side you're sitting here and the water floods in on you and gets your legs wet here and it does it on the same side here as well um, the other thing about it is as these top bows are really difficult to get up and down there's a very narrow gap here and when you've got the big canvas on it you can't really get the canvas in that you have to take the canvas off each time you hide it underneath the front uh, passenger seat just there it becomes a bit of a pain in the ass so you're seeing a lot in world war ii you see the top bows 
A, sometimes they're not even on the vehicle, they've just removed them, or they're never really put away properly. They never go from here to here. They're often hanging down here or things like that. And you also often see the, um, the top is either up or down. They didn't take it up and down all the time. You know, when winter came, top went up and you were, if you were less, uh, less worried about the enemy or in less uh, dangerous combat zones. Um, and in summer, the top went down and didn't come back up again. So if it rained, you got wet. And this is, uh, this is understandable. Um, the thing about these top bows is I complain about the design, but I was thinking about it. I can't think of a better design for the top. You know, these bows are difficult to get out here and put up. But then again, how else would you do it? The top bows are strong. It has to be strong. People grab on here. They jump on the Jeep and things like that. So something flimsy is going to get um, damaged all the time. It has to be simple to design. It's just two bent bits of metal. Um, it's easy to do, you know, well, it's difficult to put up, but it's, a, it's, in, a, it's a, in theory easy to put it up. You just undo it and dunk it in here. You know, that's not difficult. It has to be strong. I've driven the uh, top bows up at, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour and the hood's uh, nice and tight and doesn't flap around. So if you were to design something else, you know, like one of those weird concertina tops or something like that, which looked like, a you know, made like an umbrella sort of thing, um, that flimsy stuff would just get ripped off straight away and damaged. The top bows are actually the best simple idea for putting up the hood and keeping the weather off your head that I can think of. So I actually think they did a really good job with that for considering the design of the Jeep and what it was designed for, to make something strong, light, easy, simple, and mostly worked um, is damn good. So really, it not being weatherproof, yeah, it is bad. Obviously, weather in Jeeps is a is a is a big problem. You know, tell me about it. I haven't got a windscreen, um, but uh, really, I don't think they could have done anything better to improve that. I think the top bows are the best uh, the best design for a bad problem. Really, if you've got another idea about that, let me know because I can't think of anything else. So good on them for that. But there you go. The damn thing isn't weatherproof, and you get wet sitting here, and your legs get wet, and you get a cold driving around in it like I have before. But uh, ah, we love them anyway. Number four on the green dot gripes about the World War II Jeep. Oh, it's just getting worse for this poor little vehicle. Um, is the damn thing isn't strong enough now. <laughs> okay, let's start talking about the strength of this thing. This thing is designed to do a job and to a weight. It has to be portable. It has to be easily moved around, picked up. You have to be able to move it in the field. We've got the... Uh, the handles on the side there so we can manhandle the thing around um, and it still has to be pretty strong you know um, it's going to get jumped on people are going to jump on the hoods you're going to bundle as much things on it and equipment and everything as possible so it has to be pretty strong but obviously it can't be too strong because strength equals weight um, so what we have is a whole load of common problems with these if you find one today the front horns will be damaged they'll all be bent over and damaged okay because people crash the front of it into things and it bends the horns now here we go people crash the front of it into things. If you crash a vehicle into something, it generally will bend it. It's only because later vehicles have uh, better designs and better absorption areas and things like that, that you can get away with bumping it into things and what have you, and maybe it won't completely bend the front horns or things like that. But overall, I mean, you've got to expect if you, if you hammer it into things, it's gonna get damaged. And that brings me on to the other point. These vehicles get abused. So we can't confuse the weakness of the vehicle with abuse, okay? Because what we're looking at is a vehicle which is near nearly 80 years old now and people treat them like you know they're a magic vehicle because they are pretty much you know the first proper off-roader so people think they can do whatever they want with them and they put them to bed wet and they don't clean them up they don't do the preventive maintenance get all that water out of that differential and things like that and what happens as well is the maintenance people are doing to this is out in the field where obviously as we can see it's a muddy old place and dirty old place so we're not working on these things in perfect conditions so grit and crud gets in the oil, starts to damage things. So let's talk about the transfer case. These World War II Jeeps only have a three quarter inch intermediate shaft inside the transfer case. And that's seen as a weak point of them. And it is really, because there's a very small surface area taking a hell of a lot of load. But a lot of the damage to those is because they've been run for years and years and years with bad oil, dirty oil, and all the crud gets on that shaft and damages it. Reproductions, we're using non-hardened shafts in there and they're wearing out. So don't confuse poor maintenance or less than optimum maintenance, too much use and poor parts with being a poor design. The design works well, you know. The one thing I love about this Jeep is that I have not had a single issue whatsoever with the um, drivetrain for it. The transmission, the differentials, transfer case run flawlessly, absolutely beautiful, straight out the box. So I've never thought, oh, you know what, this thing's, this thing's a bit crappy. No, I've always been really pleased with it. Obviously the frame is, uh, fairly weak in the center on the GPWs you get a crack 
on the uh, frame underneath there. That's very common as well. A lot of fatigue, a lot of use for these things, a lot of off-road use, abuse on farms and things like that. That uh, causes them to crack the engine as well around the distributor hole. If you don't put antifreeze in it, surprisingly, the engine will freeze and it breaks at the block uh, just around that distributor hole. But again, that's not perhaps a weakness of the vehicle. Maybe vehicles where that area there was perhaps a little bit stronger would survive um, you know, a freeze in the block. But the Jeep's block is not supposed to get frozen. You're supposed to do the correct maintenance. You're supposed to put antifreeze in there and that shouldn't happen. So although she's a weak thing in some ways, she's not really. She's just abused and not looked after the correct way she's supposed to. People haven't read the manuals about it, you know, or then in positions not to be able to do that. Perhaps you've got, uh, you haven't got any um, coolant in there or antifreeze in the block and it freezes one night, you know, that's, uh, and you're out in the field and you don't have any antifreeze. I mean, that's just the way things go, isn't it? It. but um yeah it's not really weak i think she's a strong little beast it's just perhaps we abuse her too much and expect too much of her okay jeepers here it is number five you've been waiting for it now this actually really is um one of the worst features on this vehicle and i don't get this because i haven't heard anybody ever mention this before and i didn't notice it on my past jeep either but it does actually appear to be a real bad feature on the jeep okay and that is the dimmer switch right the dimmer switch location so we've got our fire extinguisher here my last jeep didn't have a fire extinguisher it the uh, arms were broken off it like many of the markers they're quite weak and they snap off so i didn't have a fire extinguisher so this problem didn't appear to me it's only since i've used this vehicle that the problem has appeared to me the dimmer switch is under here okay that's it just there that's a dimmer switch that does your high beam and your low beam when you uh, swap it over okay now if we get in the jeep and try and operate the dimmer switch we uh, run into a problem okay we're in the jeep now and you might have to excuse this leg here because unfortunately it's very difficult to um get the shot in here with uh yeah with my other leg in the way anyway right we're sitting in the jeep now right there's a sherman coming towards us we've got our high beam on we don't want to we don't want to blind him so he doesn't run us over so we're going to dip the dimmer switch okay we're going to dip the lights down so let's do it then foot's on the clutch um hello have, have i missed something here what's going on you can't you can't reach the dimmer switch. I mean, I've, it, you know, guys, tell me if I'm missing something here or I've missed the memo about this or something like that. But um, you just can't reach it. It's impossible to do with your foot on the clutch here. Okay, let's push it down. Somehow I might be able to ro roll it over. I don't know, maybe with a clutch in. But when your foot's up here, there's literally... There's no space to do this whatsoever. You can't get your foot in, you know. My feet are, are large, obviously, but even with smaller feet, I think you'd have difficulty doing it. What angle are you supposed to come in it at? You're supposed to put your arm down there and do it? It just seems mad to me. So I think I've actually found the single, a real, a real bad design, you know, on this vehicle. I found the first one, the first real one, is that um, you can't actually operate the dimmer switch. It seems totally bizarre. I'm, I'm really unsure about that one. But um, yeah, I mean, if you design a vehicle and the worst thing is that the dimmer switch is hard to to hit, I mean, that's, uh, you're doing pretty well, aren't you? You're doing something quite well with it. So she's not a bad vehicle at all, but yeah, that's it. That's my first number one, or should I say number five, uh, worst feature on the World War II Jeep is you can't actually operate the dimmer switch. Bizarre. Let's be honest, people, if you could build a vehicle like this with the uh, design constraints, the weight constraints and the size constraints as good as this and for it to still work so well nearly 80 years later and practically be unsurpassed by anything. I mean, you've been doing damn well. So despite all these problems, the worst features on this Jeep, I think we can say with a dimmer switch being the worst feature that I've been able to find on it, we're not doing badly at all. But yeah, that's it, gents. That's the uh, World War II Jeep's worst uh, features maybe six volt starting system as well there we go just it's cold she's cooled down now we're all like that when we're cold but if those are the worst features that you can come up with then you're doing very well but that's it everybody see you next time hope you enjoyed that like and subscribe join me on patreon